Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Denver Scleroderma Foundation Educational well. Summit, uh, brought to you by the National Scleroderma Foundation Rocky Mountain Chapter. I'm Michael Purcell, and I have the privilege and honor of serving as chair of the Chapter Committee Advisory uh, Committee, and I welcome you this morning. This morning's session is entitled Navigating Scleroderma. Before we get started, I need to go over a few housekeeping rules. Uh, the event is actually brought to you by UC Health, a longtime partner of the National Scleroderma Foundation Rocky Mountain Chapter. UC Health, which is located in Aurora, Colorado, has been designated as a scleroderma research treatment center by the National Scleroderma Foundation. Their multidisciplinary program provides comprehensive care for people living with scleroderma and also provides patients and, uh, and caregivers opportunities to participate in clinical research trials. The National Scleroderma Foundation in no way endorses clinical trials, treatments, or studies mentioned in the session. Because the manifestations and severity of scleroderma vary among individuals, personalized medical management is essential. Therefore, strongly recommended that all drugs and treatments be discussed with your individual doctor. This webinar is for educational purposes only. It is my honor now to introduce the speaker this morning, Dr. Kimmy Kondo. Dr. Kondo received her osteopathic medical degree from the Moyne University College of Osteopathic Medicine, did her residency and fellowship in interventional radiology at the University of Colorado. I've had the pleasure of working with Kimmy over the last four years with, with being on the chapter advisory committee, with her being on the medical advisory board, and now on the chapter advisory committee as well. And it has been a real pleasure to learn from, from Dr. Kondo during, during this time. In her free time, she likes to spend going around the world, <laughs> cycling and hiking and, and playing with her cats. Well, thank you so much for asking me to do this. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So I'm hoping that you can see my screen. Just let me know if you can't. So I am an interventional radiologist and I work at the University of Colorado. I don't myself treat scleroderma patients, but I, in terms as, as the main person, but I certainly see a number of scleroderma patients in my practice. And also um, I'm a caregiver for my wife who has scleroderma. So I can see it from both sides. So today what I'd like to talk about is just kind of go over, you know, the disease a little bit, you know, especially for those of you who are might have just uh, starting to know about it, and then to hopefully give you some tips as you're progressing along on this journey. So first of all, what is scleroderma? Well, as you might have heard, it's a very rare disease and there's estimated to be only about 300,000 cases in the United States. It's what we call an autoimmune disease where unfortunately there's dysregulation of our normal immune system where instead of it fighting against other diseases or viruses or stuff like that, that things, that system goes out of whack and it starts attacking our own body. So with scleroderma, uh, what happens is that there's collagen and our body thinks that there's some type of injury so that collagen is formed, which leads to fibrosis. But unfortunately, that injury hasn't actually occurred. Um, because of that collagen, we also call this a connective tissue disease. And it's something chronic, meaning that it goes on for a long time. And there's many, many different types of connective tissue diseases. In terms of who gets it, it most commonly occurs in women, 80%, but it also occurs in men and then young children and teens. Although the type of scleroderma that usually occurs in younger children is gonna be a different type as you're gonna see. There is a higher incidence in African-American individuals as opposed to Caucasians. And typically it strikes adults between 25 and 55 years old. But again, this is not any absolutes. Unfortunately, the cause is unknown and that's why there's so much research going on and why it's so important for us to be supporting these groups and 
why you know the National Scleroderma Foundation is out there. Um, and uh, right now, there's no known cure. Now, some of the symptoms we may have treatments for and everything like that. But in terms of saying, you know, like if you have cancer and we have a treatment to treat cancer, well, we have treatments to treat the things that happen in scleroderma, but not scleroderma itself. In terms of the two types, um, basically one main type will be localized and then that's uh, further broken down to morphia. So we're talking about the skin and there's patches of involvement. If it's linear, it's kind of more, again, kind of like a line. The incoup de sabre is if you've got a patch on your forehead. Um, and you can see here that most of the time it's going to be in children. Whereas systemic sclerosis is something that's going to be more common in adults. And that can be broken down into two types, one called limited, otherwise some People talk about crest, um, like calcinosis and, and those types of things, the CREST, you know, are different symptoms. And then you are, have diffuse. One of the big differences is that with the systemic as opposed to localized is that you're going to have more internal organ involvement. Again, if we're talking about systemic sclerosis, um, some of the differentiation between limited and diffuse is exactly where it affects the skin. So as you can see here in limited, you're gonna have kind of the face, uh, more of the peripheral part or the, of the extremities we call, so the hands and the forearms and the lower legs and the feet, whereas on the diffuse, it's gonna be involved also the trunk. So the upper arms, the thighs, the trunk, those types of things. Um, diffuse tends to have more severe internal organ um, involvement and it might progress more aggressively than limited, but again, there's a spectrum. In terms of clinical presentation, um, many, many different types of presentations. Um, some people might be like in this person, start out with very puffy hands. Maybe it's with arthritis. Um, other people might start off with maybe problems with their esophagus and thinking they have reflux. Both of those things are very common. So it's not something that people are gonna jump to say, hey, you've got scleroderma. I mean, with the hands, you might be thinking, well, maybe this is, if it's not osteoarthritis or due to wear and tear, maybe it's if they're thinking of something rheumatological, then it could be something like rheumatoid arthritis or because of the puffiness, maybe lupus or something like that. Um, reflux is something that is so very common and can be uh, due to many, many different causes. So again, that's not going to be your first thought of scleroderma. Again, a very spectrum of symptoms that can affect all the different body symptoms. And there's a lot of overlap. Even if you're diagnosed with scleroderma, sometimes you might have you know, uh, symptoms of lupus or mixed connective tissue disease and stuff like that. So it's not very clear. And especially at the beginning, some of the markers may be positive for one or the other. And it's not until kind of things progress and it becomes more classically scleroderma that sometimes they're able to make that diagnosis. And that's why we often see a delay in the diagnosis you've heard of, you know, anywhere from months to years, unfortunately. Um, part of that is because it's so rare. And so it's not the first thing that your physician or your clinician is gonna think about. And we kind of have a saying that no two patients are alike. Um, if you go to the national conference or you talk to support group uh, patients and, and they tell their story, um, none of the stories are alike. They're always a little bit different or a little bit different in severity. And so that's what makes this so much more difficult than say somebody with lung cancer or breast cancer because it's it just follows a more regular and classic pattern. With um, 
one of the common things may be Raynaud symptoms. So as you can see in this picture, with cold, the fingertips and sometimes the feet can turn white. Um, then you might see where it can turn blue and then it can pro progress to turning red. And, um, you know, it could be a really sunny day, but if the temperature is a little bit colder, that can happen uh, with this syndrome. Greater than 90% of the patients have, with scleroderma have <clears throat> Raynaud's. And so it's very, very common. Um, and you will see that it may not be the first presenting symptom, but a lot of people have it. Um, however, just because you have Raynaud's does not mean that you have scleroderma. Um, it's something that's found in a lot of other conditions like lupus, mixed connective tissue disease. Sometimes you could have various medications that can induce Raynaud's. Um, if you have trauma, say from you work with your hands and fib vibrations, that can even cause Raynaud's. And so again, even though it's kind of a hallmark of scleroderma, just because you have it does not mean that you have scleroderma. Something that's very common that you're going to hear about um, blood work is going to be the anti-nuclear antibody. It's something where we look under immunofluorescence and what you can see here are three different patterns that if you look at your laboratory work, you might see it described as speckled versus nucleolar versus centromere. And this is what they're looking at. Again, having a positive ANA is going to be very common in patients with scleroderma. But again, just because you have a positive ANA does not mean that you have scleroderma. And so that's kind of the confusing thing. However, if you have scleroderma, it's pretty likely that your ANA is going to be positive. There are also various autoantibodies that are important for you to know because of the fact that if these are positive, there are associations which help us to, to kind of be on the lookout. So again, maybe say if you have the anti-centromere antibody or a positive ACA, um, again, it's more common in people who have the limited cutaneous form. Maybe you don't have any problems with high pressures um, or pulmonary hypertension, but it's something that if you're positive, that we're gonna be screening and monitoring you for because there's a higher likelihood that you can develop this. In terms of people with interstitial lung disease, again, oftentimes they might have a positive anti-toparamase um, one um, autoantibody, but again, people who don't, who have negative, still might develop interstitial lung disease. Um, Anti-RNA polymerase three is often associated what, with what we call scleroderma, scleroderma renal crisis. So they're gonna be checking your kidney function, looking at your blood pressure, those types of things. Um, these patients um, typically are gonna have the more diffuse form as in the same with the people who have a positive anti-SCL70. Screening tests. So what are screening tests? Well, basically it's something where, you know, we want to see, do you have this, whether or not you may have symptoms. So a very common screening test that's going to be um, ordered for patients who might present or we might be suspicious who have scleroderma is gonna be a pulmonary function test. And so this is a, a common report that you're going to see. The other thing, because there's involvement of the heart, you know, pulmonary hypertension, another might be an echocardiogram, which is a special ultrasound where we're looking at the function of the heart. Um, we're looking to see how things open and close, what the pressures are, those types of things. And then um, because of the effect in terms of the lungs and breathing and with the laying down of fibrosis, we're also gonna get a special type of CT scan of the chest called a high resolution 
CT scan. And this is an example of that. Um, and this is what we call lung window. We actually, this is pretty normal where we're seeing lung tissue. And later on, I'll show you an example of somebody who does have lung fibrosis. When you have symptoms, say, you, you know, it's very common with scleroderma to have problems with your esophagus, maybe you have reflux, maybe you have dysphagia or trouble swallowing, then we're gonna order a test that's gonna be looking for a diagnosis to confirm, do you have this problem or not? So again, if you're having trouble swallowing, one of the things that we may order might be what we call a modified barium swallow. This is, we're lo looking at x-ray and this stuff in the mouth is barium that we're asking you to swallow while we're looking at x-ray. And what we're looking for is that swallowing mechanism. You know, when we do that, we want to make sure that things close and that 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 barium doesn't go down into the down the trachea, and that's called aspiration. So that's a, a special type of test. Other tests that might be diagnostic might be if you have, say, an abnormal echocardiogram then maybe we may have to do something like a right heart catheterization to determine, do you have pulmonary hypertension? If you have problems, again, with your esophagus besides something like a barium swallow, you might have an endoscopy you know, with a gastroenterologist. There are also tests that we might do that might be more also monitoring. So, like pulmonary function tests, we get it to screen, but we'll also get it to monitor. So if somebody might have mild involvement in their lungs, we're gonna get PFT say every six months or uh, once a year or something like that to see are those factors in terms of um, how well you oxygenate or your lung capacity, that type of thing. Is it increasing or decreasing over time? And because not every patient has the same symptoms, then testing is gonna be really individualized based on your needs. So you may hear, you know, somebody else that you know with scleroderma had a certain test and you're like, why didn't I get it? Well, maybe you don't have the signs and symptoms that is going to uh, make your provider think that you need that test. However, if you're having similar things, you may ask your provider, hey, you know, I'm having these symptoms. Somebody I know has scleroderma. Do I need this test as well? So that's something important. When you go to a physician, and we'll talk about how to maybe maximize your visit, but I want you to kind of know what we are thinking about and looking at and so you have an idea. And now with open records, you may actually be reading um, the notes from the visit. So all my notes, when I see patients, they're able to actually see it. So uh, a lot of times we have it in what we call the SOAP format. So S is subjective. I'm gonna talk about, you know, what is the chief complaint? Why did the patient come in and, and see me? Is it because they have cough? Is it because, you know, again, they've got Raynaud syndrome. syndrome. And then how has that progressed over time? When did it start? Is it getting worse? Um, you know, how many years have they had it? Important things, what allergies do you have? Because if we might are considering a medic, some type of medication, we don't want to give you something that you're allergic to. Um, Medical history, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have diabetes? Do you have um, asthma? Those types of things, because again, that helps us to know the overall picture. What surgeries have you had? What are your current medications? Family history, you know, uh, mother, father, uh, those types of things. Uh, when you have a cancer, a lot of times that's really important. Do other uh, people in your family have a history of that if, say, it's something that might have a genetic disposition. Social history, 
Do you drink alcohol? Do you smoke? Those types of things. Because again, it's very important and it makes us think of other things to ask you. And then our review of systems will go head to toe. Now, then we might go to the objective things, you know, vital signs, blood pressure, pulse, respiration, oxygen saturation, physical examination. Initially, when we don't know you, that's going to be a more thorough exam. However, on follow-up, it may be more directed. Maybe you have a certain issue and we're going to, you know, be looking specifically at what those physical manifestations are. Um, say if you're abdominal pain, we're going to be, you know, feeling your, your palpating, your abdomen, those types of things. Laboratory tests, what have you had in the past and what are those, uh, are there positive and negatives and stuff? And again, just because something's positive, we, we kind of look at the whole general picture, okay? So one positive thing doesn't necessarily mean that you have, that it's diagnostic. What imaging studies do you have you had? CTs, ultrasounds, those types of things. Procedures, have you had a swelling exam? Have you had an endoscopy? What are those reports, surgeries? And then looking at all of that, we're gonna have our impression. What do we think's going on based on the subjective, on the objective? And then that leads us to our plan. Do we need to order other tests or procedures or imaging? Do we need to refer you to other specialists and you know, follow up? You know, when do you need to come back and see me for us to go over maybe the test and the procedures that I've ordered, those types of things. So now you know what we're looking for. How do you maximize your visit? Okay. First of all, it starts before you even come in to see a provider. When you make the appointment, it's important to communicate why you want to see that physician because unfortunately, we only have a limited amount of time to see people. And so if you're coming in for say an annual exam for initial visit, the amount of time set aside for that is going to be longer than say a follow-up examination. So if you don't tell the schedulers that, they may not schedule you for the appropriate type of appointment. And then, you know, if maybe you don't speak English well or you need an interpreter, let us know that so we have it there, so we, we aren't having difficulty communicating with you. Make a list of your concerns and questions and order it by importance so that when you come, you get the things that are most important and address them first. Because again, we may run out of time. You may need to set up another appointment to discuss other things. Know your history. A lot of times there may be health questionnaires that we ask you to fill out beforehand, and that's really important. That's going to save time during the visit. If you have medical records or you've been seen somewhere else, let us know that because, you know, if we can get that information before your visit and review it, again, then we can spend time with your concerns at that time. Having the names and contact info of the other people that you've seen is really important because otherwise it's difficult for us to run that down and find that out. You might just come, you know, with business cards from, from other people that you've seen, especially if it happens to be somebody in a different health system. Medications, prescription medicines, over-the-counter supplements, you know, what is a dosage, when and how you're taking them. Um, you know, have a list and bring that list to us. If you're not sure, you know, put all of them in a Ziploc bag and bring them. I mean, that's better than saying, oh, I take this blue pill. And when we ask you, what is it for? And you don't know. Consider bringing a family friend or um, a, a family member because they can be an extra set of eyes and ears. They can write notes down um, for you. They might remember something you don't remember later on. They can help to remind you to ask the question you wanted to ask. But at the same time, 
if that person's going to be in the room with you, you need to feel comfortable with them hearing all this. Maybe if there's something that's a little bit that something they you don't want them to hear, then ask for them to step out while you talk to your doctor, um, that type of thing. During the visit, be honest. Um, we can't help you if we don't know what's going on. And then, like I say, discuss the concerns and questions by order of importance. Stay focused. We only have a certain amount of time. So if you, you know, talk about a story, that's great. But if it's not relevant, then you may not get to the important stuff. Be an active participant. This is a two-way street, especially some doctors, unfortunately, um, they don't may not be speaking in a vocabulary that you understand. They may be too much doctor speak or too much medical jargon. If you don't understand what they're talking about, say, hey, I don't get it. Can you explain it in a different way? And, you know, if they can't, then think about, is this the right person for me? Because, again, if you don't understand what you're we're talking about, then you're not going to be able to be compliant or follow through. And then it's not going to be helpful. Take notes and then leave with a plan. Do you know what's the next step? Do you know when you need to follow up? Those types of things. Afterwards, follow through. If we've asked you to take to do certain tests, you know, go and do them. If you, we've asked you to see other people, please do that. Make follow-up appointments and then You've got to be your own advocate. So it's important for you to have copies of your tests, your imaging studies, your procedures, because as you're going to see, you're going to be talking to a lot of people. And especially if they're in different healthcare systems, we may not have easy access to those records. But if you can give it to us, then that's going to save time. And if you have questions, you don't remember something, don't hesitate to call us or Call somebody on the healthcare team. You know, a lot of times we've got nurse coordinators or other people that maybe you can't get a hold of me, but you can get a hold of my physician assistant or my nurse practitioner, those types of things. One thing I want to make you aware of is that our clinical notes are actually open to you and have to be by federal law shared by the health systems. And by the end of 2022, it needs to be shared by a, a third party application that you can download to your iPad or your smartphone or you know um, your Android or whatever. And those things do include you know histories and physicals, uh, the reports from imaging studies, your labs, pathology, um, any procedures, progress notes, clinic visit notes, those types of things. Now, it may not be, you might read it and you may not know what it says or understand, that's when you need to ask us. Sometimes it's uploaded immediately to the portal. So you may actually see it before I see it. If that happens, then, you know, again, ask or communicate with us. Um, sometimes things can be scary, especially with pathology reports. You know, don't, don't stress yourself out, just ask. In terms of those patient portals, this is an example of one from National Jewish, and you can see that you can make appointments through this. You can refill prescriptions. You can see your notes. This is one from Kaiser. All your test results, the current and the previous, you can look at if you had a, a blood count, what was it today and what was it previously? So you can compare and contrast. This is one from SCL Health and this is um, from the App Store where you can actually download this to your phone. Um, for UC Health, I have my health connection. I actually have it on my phone because not only am I a provider, but I'm a, a patient. And so these are all the things that I can do. And if you look here, I can even get a Lucy summary, which is, again, all my medical information that I can easily download, have on my phone. So when I go to see somebody else, it's all there. 
Okay, so this is the, the one great thing of the electronic medical record. In terms of assembling your team, like I said, scleroderma affects a lot of the different systems of the body. So unfortunately, not one person is going to be able to handle everything. You're going to see a bunch of different specialists. However, you've got to make sure that those people will talk to each other and be your own advocate. You're going to have to unfortunately keep track of these things because again, scleroderma is rare. It may be something that that particular provider is not as familiar with, with uh, as opposed to other things more common. So for example, the GI tract, you know, scleroderma patients get strictures, they might have malnutrition, they may have reflux, they can get what we call small intestinal bowel overgrowth, where, you know, the bad bacteria outgrows the good bacteria, um, there could be dysmotility, you could have GI bleeding from something called GAVE, um, you could have dysmotility, so maybe you have diarrhea or constipation, those types of things. Um, so you might see a gastroenterologist, but remember that gastroenterologist may be more familiar with treating ulcers or reflux that are caused for different reasons. So you might need to make sure that he or she understands what are the gastrointestinal symptoms specifically involved with scleroderma. You may also be needing to see a dietitian or nutritionist. Those are other people that are on your team. And then say if you have malnutrition and you might need a feeding tube, well, um, that's something that me as an interventional radiologist does. And so you may be seeing me as part of your care team. In terms of respiratory, again, patients have interstitial lung disease, especially if you are positive for the anti-RNA polymerase three. This is an example of on high resolution chest CT, where because of fibrosis that there's damage to this part of the right lower, excuse me, the left lower lobe and the right lower lobe and where we get what we call bronchiectasis, where those airways get big, or maybe you, um, again, because of that reflux, you get aspiration pneumonia um, or an infection type of thing. Maybe you have pulmonary hypertension. So you're gonna be seeing a pulmonologist. Maybe you're gonna see a respiratory therapist because, you know, again, in order to, to maybe pulmonary rehab or you're on oxygen. Cardiovascularly, maybe again with the Raynaud's, it's not uncommon that because of poor blood flow that you can get ulcers on your fingertips that may turn into gangrene or something like that. So you may need to see somebody from wound care, maybe occupational therapy, because again, you know, with that pain, you can't use your hands as well. And, you know, maybe you need a hand surgeon or a vascular surgeon to improve the blood flow to allow those ulcers to heal. Other things, part of the cardiovascular things, again, pulmonary hypertension. This is a chest x-ray of somebody whose pulmonary arteries, or basically those, you know, go to the lungs, become enlarged because of increased pressures in those arteries or those blood vessels get enlarged. And so again, you might need to see a cardiologist and a pulmonologist, but remember cardiologists usually might treat atherosclerotic disease or angina or you know, people who have heart attacks, which is a different part of the side of the heart than somebody who has increased blood pressure and increased pulmonary the size of the pulmonary arteries. And so they need to know that. And it needs to be somebody that's going to be looking out for those signs and symptoms. In terms of the kidneys, again, scleroderma renal crisis, especially if you've got anti polymerase, uh, RNA polymerase three, hypertension is something we're going to be looking at your blood pressure. If your kidneys get damaged, it may be the type of thing that you need dialysis 
where it could be, might be hemodialysis blood, or it could be peritoneal dialysis. So you're going to be seeing a nephrologist who's going to be monitoring that. Maybe again, you're going to see an interventional radiologist because I'm going to be putting that catheter in or, um, and maintaining it. Maybe you need a vascular surgeon because again, if you have dialysis and you need a fistula or a graph in order to get hemodialysis, they're the ones that are gonna create it. Or maybe you need a renal transplant surgeon if you're gonna have some type of kidney transplant or a peritoneal dialysis catheter put into your abdomen. In terms of skin and musculoskeletal things, again, you know, with that skin thickening, a lot of times you get deformi- you know, deformity of your hands, sclerodactyly, where maybe you can't make a fist or maybe you can't straighten your hands. You can get basically deposits of calcium or calcinosis. You can have pain or weakness in your joints and muscles. With skin thickening, you know, maybe you need to see a dermatologist. Again, if you have decreased function in your hands or pain or weakness, maybe you're gonna see a physical therapist or occupational therapist. Maybe somebody in integrative medicine, somebody who does acupuncture or massage, those types of things. And then don't forget, patients with scleroderma, unfortunately, have small mouths and sometimes uh, or decreased saliva. So you're going to be more likely to have cavities. So you're going to be seeing the dentist and the orthodontist. Um, pharmacist, you're going to be on a, t- you might be on a ton of medication steroids, things that we use to, uh, that might be, you know, things, immunosuppressants, these things have side effects and the pharmacist is going to be the person that's going to be able to help you out with this because maybe it's a drug that you don't tolerate, but there may be another drug in the same class and the pharmacist is, has a wealth of information to help that. A psychiatrist or psychologist, you may need to see somebody like that because this is stressful and this is going to go on over a long period of time. So don't forget about your mental health. And then nurses, social workers, nurse practitioners, physician assistant, they're all part of the healthcare team. And you're really going to need a multidisciplinary team um, to, to work with. And then finally, the rheumatologist, Um, they're going to be the captain of the ship. They're going to be the one that more than likely is going to be kind of coordinating this and running this. But it's important to find the right doctor, even though the rheumatologist is treat scleroderma. Somebody who's done a rheumatology internal medicine, then a rheumatology fellowship, they might not have seen very many patients with scleroderma in their training. You know, they may be more treating lupus or other types of connective tissue disease. So it's really important that you see somebody who has treated a lot of patients. And so you might say, how many cases have you seen and patients have you cared for who have my disease? And then, you know, who do you talk to when you have questions or difficult cases? That's important. It's really important to find somebody that you're comfortable with because if you don't trust them, then you're not gonna follow their advice. And it's a relationship, it's really important. If the person you see you're not comfortable with, find somebody else. Don't be afraid to ask for a second opinion. If that person gets offended because you want a second opinion, is that really the person that you want? Um, You know, if somebody asks me for a second opinion, I'm not offended, go right ahead. And and that's important. And again, that rheumatologist is gonna be the leader of all those other ologists. Don't forget the other team members, your spouse, family members, friends, and I put your four-legged children as well, your pets, um, you know, in terms of the comfort they provide you, um, you know, unconditional love, caregivers, support groups, maybe 
virtual or in or you know especially with covid um hopefully we can get back to in-person support groups don't forget spiritual support maybe you know some type of personal trainer or, or coach who knows um and in terms of sources of information the national scleroderma has a lot of information out there and don't forget your local chapter one thing, however, if you go to the internet and you look for information, beware, because it's important that you go to credible sources, um, because there's a lot of stuff out there, but is it backed by the science, backed by research, that type of thing? Um, you know, various universities, University of Michigan has a scleroderma center, you know, Duke or University of Utah, University of Colorado, National Jewish, those are all places which may have really good information that's credible. Questions? Thank you, Dr. Kondo, very much. Um, very informative today. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left in the session and, and we do have a, um, a couple of questions. Um, one is, do scleroderma patients move from limited to systemic slash diffuse by symptoms, or once you're diagnosed by autoantibodies, do you always remain with that designation? Again, uh, you know, um, I would say that a lot of times, if you're limited or if you're diffuse, it's kind of that way. And again, this is something to talk to the rheumatologist because again, they're the ones that that see these types of patients, but it could be that maybe because of your signs and symptoms that initially they think you have limited where could it be that maybe it's a misdiagnosis because you haven't shown the other signs and symptoms of diffuse yet. Um, it, it's a really, really difficult diagnosis there is a, um, the American College of Rheumatology in, in ULAR does have a checklist criteria of different things to help clinicians out. Okay. And I would say that, you know, again, even if you're seen by a local rheumatologist, you may want to go to um, a specialized scleroderma center that's out of state. It may not be something that, you know, they do your local care, but maybe you go there once a year just to check up, you know, am I getting all the things, you know, um, that I need? Um, and am I on the right course of treatment, that type of thing? Okay. The next question is, do we know why scleroderma can be more common in African American people? Um, I don't believe that we know that. Um, you know, again, some of it is just, you know, it's things that we observe or epidemiologically. I honestly don't know for sure. And that's, again, something that to ask your um, specialists and stuff like that. Um, but again, I think the more that we learn about the mechanisms of action and why, what causes it, we're going to better understand why it affects certain, um, you know, men versus women or women versus men and, and different ethnic groups. And then the last question is, if someone is limited in access to most resources, um, ologists, and even treatments, including being able to drive, are there resources that can be available online if they are isolated and live in a rural place? I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the presentation today. Well, again, that's where I think having resources like the support groups, because they may have ideas of resources that they have utilized, um, contacting your local scleroderma found, uh, chapter. Um, now with, um, you know, virtual, even if you're rural and, and uh, you can hop on, you, you know, to another chapter and everything like that. Uh, you don't have to be within that state. And I'm sure you're going to find people that are going to help you nurses and social workers at wherever you are, are also good sources of information for those types of things. Um, because hospital systems, you know, they can get vouchers for, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
transportation, those types of things. I think even like Uber or Lyft, you know, might have programs where they're decreased um, uh, or, you know, they provide transportation to places. So I would, you know, certainly look at those resources. Um, and I think people are putting in the chat in terms of website addresses and stuff like that. Yes, they are. Um, and that was the end of the, of the questions um, that came up. And Dr. Kondo, thank you so much for, for presenting today. Much appreciated. Want to give a special shout out to our sponsor, UC Health. Um, we would also like to connect with you uh, after the conference. Um, you will see links within the chat um, that talks about um, different research centers, how you can get with the Rocky Mountain chapter, support groups, those types of things. So I, I would tell you to, to check that out. Um, and then uh, if you haven't thought about it, think about becoming a member of the foundation for $25 a year. Uh, all those donations go to support the mission to advance medical research, promote education and awareness, and support people and caregivers of people with scleroderma. So with that, thank you for attending. Thank you, Dr. Kondo. Thank you, UC Health. Thank you all for, for being there. And then we'll see you at the next session at 11 o'clock. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Take care.